It's July 1969. Remember what happened then? The moon landing? When the world set, I mean, absolutely glued to the television? You, the two heroes of that story, Aldrin and Armstrong, they get the brunt of the accolades, the pats on the back. They're the two guys that will be remembered in history, but there was actually three guys that went up there. That third guy, a man by the name of Michael Collins. And how that whole operation worked is all three of them flew up there, and then as they approached the moon, the Aldrin and Armstrong get in the landing module, and, and they descend to the moon. Michael Collins, he makes orbits around the moon while they're down on the moon. They stay there for 22 hours. He makes about 22 laps around the moon. And then eventually they get back in the landing craft and they ascend and they dock and come back to earth. 22 times around the moon. But there's a point where when Collins is orbiting the moon, that he falls behind the moon. They call it the far side of the moon. And when you're in the far side of the moon, there is no sunlight, you can't see earth, and all communications with Houston is cut off. And that happens to him for 47 minutes. He's no communication, no light, just the, the faint light from, from the dash is all that he has. No, there's, there's no background noise. I mean, space completely silent. NASA released a press release and it said, not since Adam has any human known such solitude as Mike Collins is experiencing during his 47 minutes of each lunar revolution when he's behind the moon and no one to talk to except his tape recorder aboard Columbia. Can you imagine 47 minutes of complete darkness and silence? Most of us can't stand three seconds without noise, without talking, without something happening. But that 47 minutes must have felt like a lifetime. Tick tock, tick tock. Just hoping that we make this orbit, make another one. Just, you know, if I'm honest, the silence that he, that he experienced there, there's been times in my prayer life whenever I felt just like that. Like I was behind the dark side of the moon. Times that we pray and pray and pray and nothing seems to happen. God is completely silent or He's ignoring me or He's refusing to answer. That's a frustrating spot to find yourself in. Especially when you need an answer right now. When you have family members that are critically ill and, and you're praying on their behalf and you're interceding for them and, and you, God needs to make an appearance here. and He's got to do something. The doctors haven't given any hope. They're not optimistic. Or, or quite possibly it's when you have to make an, a major, there's a major decision that has to be made and it's on your shoulders. And if you don't make the right one, chaos could ensue. Or maybe there's a, a financial need in your life and, and, and you don't have the means to meet it and God has got to come through some way, somehow. And you're praying and you're, you're, you're pleading, God, I need you. And it's like you're on the dark side of the moon. Complete silence. I, I, for Christians, it's difficult to accept the fact that we're not hearing for God. I mean, we, in our minds, we want Him to leap into action. We want Him to descend to earth and, and snap His fingers and make everything all right. Especially in those crunch times of life. We need Him to intervene. We need Him to do a mighty work. Something that we could only label as a miracle. But then there's silence. And that's hard to accept. We've learned over the past few weeks that as we pray, God answers in one of three ways. He, he can answer yes. And he'll, or He may answer no. No is an answer. Even if He's saying no, He's still answering you. Sometimes He may say Wait. Not yet. Or just be patient. I have a better plan. But the frustrating part is when he's completely silent and there's nothing happening. 
And we, we want to, we ask this question, why is not God responding to me? Why isn't He answering my prayers? I think there's three things that create barriers to God answering our prayers. The first one, I want to bring your attention. If you've got your bulletin, you've got an outline on the back, you can follow along. Number one, the thing that keeps God from answering our prayers, unrepentant sin. That's the first place that you need to look is your heart. Are there secret sins in your life that you're holding on to? What I'm talking about, there, there might be some passions or desires or behaviors or imaginations that you're clinging to, that you're not willing to let go of. And in fact, you've probably lived with them for so long, you don't even know you could get rid of them if you wanted to. It'd be private sins that we know are wrong, but secretly we enjoy. I mean, if truth be known, we don't want anybody else to know that we enjoy them. And if anybody else knew that we was indulging in these things, I mean, you want to talk about complete and utter embarrassment. But we secretly cherish these things. I remember one time Pastor Duncan used to say, it's that secret sin that you'd pull out and pet. You know, like you had an affection for it. And it's, if you have some sort of sin that you're holding on to, that creates within you an unrepentant heart. Fun fact. You know why we sin, right? Because we like it. That's, it's just true. If, if sins weren't enjoyable, we wouldn't do them. They'd be easy to jettison. We could get rid of them and we could walk away from them. But we make accommodations for them because we like them. But in, in, the, in the big scope of God's pictures, sin is trespass against God. God said it's wrong and it may be fun, but it's still wrong. Here's how you can tell if you have an unrepentant heart. Number one is that, it's, this is really a no-brainer, no, no tricks here. An unrepentant heart, you can tell if you just keep on sinning. That's the first thing you'll notice. There's no desire for me to cease the behavior. I don't want to turn away from it. I don't want to repent. By the way, that word repent literally means to stop what I'm doing and turn and go the other way. It's, it's to acknowledge that the path that I'm on is wrong and I need a different path. I need to do a complete turnaround and go the opposite direction. But an unrepentant heart never seeks that path. It's completely content to travel along. It, it's not willing to stop, turn, and, and pursue a different direction. Another thing about the unrepentant heart, not only do you not want to stop sin, sinning, but you completely ignore God and, and, and His Spirit as they try to convict you about that sin. You, as, as a follower of Jesus, one of the things that we receive upon our salvation, upon our profession of faith, upon that decision to follow Jesus is God gives us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, one of His major functions is to convict us of sin. That conviction means that the, the Spirit is making that sin, giving me an awareness of that. It's kind of like, tapping me on the shoulder and said, hey, you know what you're doing is wrong, right? Conviction means that, that we are extremely sensitive to the wrongings of God. Any sinful thought, any sinful behavior, any sinful attitude, any sinful speech, when we do it, we immediately have a sense of guilt, if you will. That's what the Holy Spirit does. That's conviction. And so, you know that you have an unrepentant heart if you keep on sinning, and, and the Holy Spirit, who's supposed to convict us about those sins, we squash it. It's like we put Him in a corner. We shackle Him up. We don't want to hear from Him. We silence the Holy Spirit. An unrepentant heart will squash any and every conviction that the Holy Spirit presents in your life. And whenever you continually give in to that, it's going to create a dead heart, a hard heart. And that's going to be evidenced, by the way, your personality could change. Have you ever noticed somebody that has has been so steeped in sin that their heart is so unrepentant that their personality actually kind of shifts a little bit. And it's like, I don't even know you anymore. Maybe, maybe it'll be evidenced by a change in their countenance, but the way they, can, they carry themselves or the way they look, their attitudes, maybe, maybe their priorities in life begin to shift. 
That's, that's evidence of a hard heart. When, when you no longer desire holiness or righteousness or following God's path, that's evidence of a hard heart, of an unrepentant heart. And, and when you find yourself in this place where more often than not you're managing the sin than trying to overcome the sin because you're so scared about being found out. You want to get caught. And, and you're so saying, how can I live with this in such a way that I don't have to deal with the consequences. You see, an unrepentant heart, it creates a barrier to God's blessings. God is under no obligation to answer the prayers of someone who has an unrepentant heart. It's, I love the analogy of, of us offering up prayers to heaven, having a, a two-way communication, and sin almost acting like an umbrella. That as we offer up our prayers, it's just hitting the bottom of that umbrella. And coming back down on us. That's what an unrepentant heart does. And God says, I am under no obligation to answer your prayers. Here's, here's a couple of verses. It's Psalm 66, 18. David writes, he said, If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 15, Isaiah writes, When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you, even when you offer many prayers. I'm not listening. Your hands are full of blood. So, number one thing that you need to do, if, if it seems like you're on the dark side of the moon in your prayer life, and God has been silent and you need an answer, get rid of the sin you've been holding on to. Check your heart. And I'm not saying we do this just so that God answers our prayers. That's so selfish that I'm going to clean myself up because I need an answer from God. I need Him to do this for me. No, no, no. We, we seek to do away with those unrepentant hard hearts because our affection for Him outweighs the things of this world. When we repent, it's, show, it's saying, God, I love you more than I love my sin. So if, if you're in that dark side of the moon where, of your prayer life, Check your heart first and see if there's not some secret sin or something that you've been holding on to that God wants you to let go of. The second thing that will create a barrier to God answering our prayers is our relationships. I'm talking about our horizontal relationships, our relationships with one another here on this planet. God may not be answering your prayers because you have strained relationships that you haven't dealt with. I'm talking about any kind of personal conflict that you may have with another person. It may be a family member or a friend or a co-worker or a neighbor, but maybe there is issues with someone else on this planet that you're not willing to deal with. Or maybe you could have an ungodly attitude towards a particular group of people. Maybe you harbor racial prejudice or bias. Or maybe you knowingly or even unknowingly, maybe subliminally, subliminally in the back of your mind, that you sort and segregate people according to their race, color, or creed, their nationality, the way they talk. Or maybe you're just angry and hateful at other people that hold differing political views than you. We've seen that a lot the past few years. Where we just hate somebody just because they're on the other side of the aisle. I mean, we, we, we respond and, and treat them dismissively. We're disrespectful just because of who they vote for. And even in the church, we're, we're quick to sort, segregate, and judge other people just simply because of what they believe theologically. That, that, is, that creates strained relationships. And, and in the church, sometimes it's just over secondary issues that are insignificant. But we do that. It's, not, it's like, if you're not in my tribe, we don't hang. Strained relationships. God will not bless your prayers if you're holding on to the sin of strained relationships because your relationship with other people on this planet have a direct bearing on your relationship with God. That's just the way it works. If this isn't right, this isn't going to be right. So I want to encourage you to honestly, if you're, if you're on the dark side of the prayer life, maybe you need to Set, stop, and think about, do I have any relationships that are strained right now? 
honestly evaluate all of those things. Jesus talked about this on the Sermon on the Mount. It's out of Matthew chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 5. Here's what Jesus has to say about our prayer life and how it's affected by the relationships here on earth. Look at verse 21. Matthew 5, 21. Jesus said, You have heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. And so he's saying, You've heard that murder, killing another person, is the baddest thing on the planet. Jesus then lowers the bar. I guess raises the bar, maybe. Verse 22, But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you're in danger of the fires of hell. So, if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, by the way, for us, you and I, presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple is just us bowing our knees and entering into a time of prayer with God. Same thing. We don't offer sacrifices now. We don't have temples. Your body is a temple. You have the Holy Spirit residing within you. When you enter into a time of prayer, you're entering into the presence of God. That's what those people thought when they went into the temple, is I'm entering into the presence of God. So Jesus is saying, if you enter into my presence so that you can communicate with me or you can offer up these requests that you have, here's what he says, leave your sac and, and, and you, someone, you suddenly remember that someone has something against you. Now, the wording there is so important. You remember that someone has something against you. Not that you have something against someone else, but you know that someone else doesn't like you. You, I mean, you, you could have fond feelings or emotions toward this other person, but you're aware that they don't like you or they have something against you. Jesus says, verse 24, leave your sacrifice there at the altar. So don't even offer it. Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. He's saying, before you enter my presence, before you enter that time of prayer, communication, communion with me, you better make sure that every relationship you have on this planet is right. Even if you've not, even if you don't harbor any ill feelings towards that person, if you know they hold ill feelings towards you, go and make it right. The onus is on us. So it's not like you evaluate all your relationships and say, okay, I'm going to list all of the people I don't like and I'm going to go make it right. You're re listing all those relationships and saying, who has something against me? How have I offended someone else? What have I said? What have I done? How have I treated someone else? And I have to go and make those things right before I come to the altar. See, the key here is we got to make sure that the horizontal relationships are right before we enter into a time of prayer. You know, for Christians, this is just a free sidebar real quick. Christians should be the most forgiving, accepting, respectful, and humble people on the planet. And so when this world, which as we've seen over the past few years, when this world turns to violence and civil unrest out of fear of rejection, the church should be the safe haven. This should be the place that people flock to in times of trial, in times of fear. I mean, think about this. The church should be the most sought after safe haven on the planet because within those walls are people who have been forgiven. Those walls are filled with people who have been accepted themselves. Christians, you and I, we are recipients of the greatest act of kindness and love this planet has ever seen. We have committed the greatest offense by our sin. But yet we're forgiven. The church should be a safe haven God's constant command all through the gospel is what? Love one another. Love one another. His desire is to see that we all live together in harmony, regardless of race, color, creed, religion, political affiliation. He is the Prince of Peace. We are to be people of peace. He wants us to experience peace. And the church 
is His solution to allow this world to experience peace. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 through 16 says this, But now you have been united with Christ. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near Him through the blood of Christ. For Christ Himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in His own body on the cross He broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in Himself one new people from two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of His death on the cross, and our hostility toward each other was put to death as well. If God's response to you in your time of prayer is silence, why don't you not only check the welfare of your heart, but check the welfare of your relationships as well. If the Holy Spirit is convicting you of any issues in your relationships, build a bridge, not a barrier. That should be your go-to. I mean, that goes against our natural tendency. Our natural tendency is to alienate those who we have issues with. But we should build bridges, not barriers. And that first move should always be ours. We should always take that first step. I mean, Christians should never play the fault game. Well, I'm not going to do this because you're the one who's at fault. You're the reason why this happened. Christians are to take the initiative and bring every relationship into total purity and unity. Every time. Every time. Even if we're not at fault. Romans 12, 18 says, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. As far as it depends on you, that means you do your part. You accept 100% of the responsibility on your part. The third thing that you need to check is your motives. Maybe God isn't answering your prayers because you've been asking these prayers out of improper motives. I mean, Christ's servant, Christ, Christ followers are to be servant-minded. We're supposed to think of others before we think of self. But in general, our needs are number one. I want my needs met first before I'll even think about your needs. And, and that attitude even influences and, and permeates how we pray. Most of our prayers are very self-centered. God, I need this. God, I want this. God, give me this. God, answer this way. Our, our main agenda is self-gratification. So it's me first, meet my needs. My happiness takes precedence. And I'm going to pray that way. I'm going to pray in such a way that I, I've determined what's going to make me happy and I'm going to pray in that direction. Because we think we know what's best for us, don't we? We've got the path all laid out. We know how God needs to operate. And so that's how we pray. And when God doesn't meet our expectations, we give up. Because we kind of see God as a spiritual Santa Claus. If we want something, just pray about it. He'll give it to you. Go sit on Daddy's lap. Tell him what you want. James 4 says this. You want things, but you don't get them. So you kill and are jealous of others, but you still cannot get what you want. So you argue and you fight. You don't get what you want because you don't ask God. Or when you do ask, you don't receive anything because the reason you ask is wrong. You only want to use it for your own pleasure. And as long as we seek our own will, we will continuously experience the frustration of silence from God. So the last thing here is just check your motive. What, and ask yourself, why am I praying about this? Why am I asking for this? Is it, it, am, am I, and the second question would be, out of that is, am I wanting this for my glory or am I wanting this for God's glory? Whose glory am I pursuing in this request? Third question you would need to ask is, am I willing to set aside my own will and pursue His will? 
Am I willing to set aside my agenda and do whatever God asks of me? You know, through these last few weeks of, of our time together, and we've been looking at prayer, we've determined that God absolutely for sure hears everything. He hears everything, including the prayers of His children. I mean, He is God. Nothing gets by Him. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, continue to ask and God will give to you. Continue to search and you will find. Continue to knock and the door will be open for you. Yes, whoever continues to ask will receive and whoever continues to look will find. And whoever continues to knock will have the door open for them. That's not Jesus' promise. But there's no guarantee that He will answer if you have unrepentant sin in your life or you've got strained relationships, or you're doing it out of improper motives. So when when we read something like Matthew 7, wouldn't it be cool to be able to live kind of in that, that zone, that bubble, where when we ask, we're given? Is it possible to pray with, with the confidence that whenever I enter into my time of prayer, I am absolutely confident that God is going to answer? I, I, it may be a no. It may be a wait. It could be a yes. But wouldn't it be nice to be able to enter into a time of prayer with God where, where we do it with confidence, knowing that He's going to answer in some form or fashion? Or, or not only that, but that He would maybe give you what you ask for? Wouldn't that be nice to have that confidence as well? Is that even possible that we could pray in such a way that as we're praying, we're, we have a lot of confidence that God is going to answer our prayers and even give us what we're asking for. It is possible. But that's in part two, and that's next week. So I want to ask you to join us next week as we begin to look at how you can pray with confidence. Now, I will give this caveat, that confidence of of praying and receiving an answer and sometimes even getting what you ask for, that's only available for people who are children of God. People who have bowed their heart to Jesus. People who have acknowledged that I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. And that Jesus came and He shed His blood so that my sins would be paid for. And I want to I want to bow my knee and I want to accept Him as Lord of my life. Those people that have made that decision are the ones that can pray with confidence. There's really no guarantee out of Scripture that God ever answers the prayer of an unbeliever. He can. He's sovereign. He can do whatever He wants. But the, this confidence only exists, this promise is only for the children of God. So I want to enjoy, invite you to join us next week as we look at uh, how to pray with that kind of confidence. Let's pray. Father, how sweet you are to us. How kind and gracious you are. Lord, even in the midst of our sin, you showed us a great kindness by sending your Son. And he lived a perfect life And He laid that down so that we too can enjoy eternal life. Lord, that we can know for certain that our sins are paid. Lord, that we can can walk with confidence knowing that as we communicate with You, as we pray, that You're listening and, and that You'll answer. And God, I pray this morning for our people as they leave here this morning. Lord, I I'm praying with confidence that You're going to give them the the desires of their hearts if they're in line with your will. And Father, I'm just asking that you would reveal yourself to us in many and different various ways. Lord, I pray that your spirit would prompt us when there's issues like broken relationships or unrepentant hearts or improper motives. Lord, how, how sweet it is to have that kind of confidence that we can go to the creator of the universe and Ask whatever we want according to your will and know that it'll be done. Father, we praise your holy name. For it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.